second lesson is a reading from the Gospel of John. Jesus said, If you love me, you will keep my commandments, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to be with you forever. This is the Spirit of the truth, whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him because he abides with you, and he will be in you. I will not leave you orphaned. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. On that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. The, they who have my commandments and keep them are those who love me, and those who love me will be loved by my Father, and I will love them and reveal myself to them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good morning, friends. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Our first lesson this morning from the Acts of the Apostles is St. Luke the Evangelist's breathless account of an adventure of the Apostle Paul on his second missionary journey up through Turkey and across the pond into Europe. As the story in our lesson opens, Paul has arrived in the multicultural metropolis of Athens. If you haven't been to Athens yet, you want to put it at the top of your bucket list because Athens was the home to all the early luminaries of Western civilization, and so much of it is still there for you to visit. Its philosophy, its art, its math, its government, are still the basis for our world today. Athens in its golden age, 500 BC, is the city of Pericles and Democritus. It's the city-state victorious in the Persian Wars when Pheidippides ran the news of Greek victory into the Athens city center from the battlefield on the plain of Marathon 26 miles away. In the center of Athens is a mesa with sheer rock walls which loom a hundred feet above the city. This is the Acropolis and on its flat top it houses the ancient civic center and the worship center in the Parthenon and the Erechtheion and other temples. And down around the base of the Acropolis meanders a distinctive street of retail shops called the Plaka. And out at the lower end of the Plaka is the Agora, the 10-acre market area and social center for the ancient city of Athens. Above the west side of the Agora looms a tall rock, which is an outcrop of the Acropolis itself. This rock is called the Areopagus which means Mars Hill, and it's the free speech spot in Athens, just the way Hyde Park Corner is in London. Socrates used to hang out here. Aristotle lived here. In an age before electronic communication, people hungry for news hung out at the Areopagus to hear the latest from every traveler who arrived in town and to interview anybody who had an intriguing opinion. So, as I bring this travelogue part of the sermon to a close, let me just say, so much of the ancient city is still visible and standing today, ready to come alive when you visit it, that you just have to go. And Athens was already an ancient city, a city with 600 years of history, when Paul arrived there on his second missionary journey in 50 A.D. St. Luke tells us that when Paul arrived in Athens, instinctively 
he went to the synagogue as he did in any new town and began to preach Christ to the Jews. But that wasn't enough for him. He also went into the Agora and engaged non-Jews, Epicurean and so Stoic philosophers. He made enough of an impact that he was invited up to the free speech area, the Areopagus, to present his message of Christ and to be given a polite, formal hearing. Here, in the crowd on the Areopagus, is none of the defensiveness and heckling Paul runs into when he preaches Christ to Jews in the synagogue. Here are seekers after pure truth who recognize one can take many paths toward a God who is beyond all local gods and denominations. In fact, Paul begins speaking to the Athenians by noting that on his way through the city, he passed a statue addressed to the unknown God. Instead of praising them for their broad-mindedness, Paul pities them for their vulnerability. They worship a God who is too far removed to be a very present help in trouble. And he proceeds to make this unknown God known to these Athenians with their intellectualized faith. Paul introduces the God beyond all gods. This is God who created the world, of course. This is God who created humanity, of course. This is God, moreover, who created humans to long for Him and to seek Him in relationship. Paul even elaborates this point by quoting a verse from the Stoic philosopher Posidonius, who describes God in whom we live and move and have our being. And then, dramatically, Paul drops God's veil so that all may recognize the God who reveals himself to us in the risen Christ, who is the human face of God. Like the Athenians, when you and I wake to realize that what it means for us to be created in God's image is to seek and find God in the face of another person. When we realize that, then we can engage people with confidence that God is already here between us and God will emerge from our encounters with one another. We love it when a social encounter turns into a God encounter. Even a political confrontation can turn into a God encounter. Here's an example. We're in the city of Rome in the high Middle Ages. Pope Urban IV receives a delegation of powerful Christian merchants and guildsmen from the city, and they are angry. Their spokesman says, Your Holiness, the Jews are taking over our city. They're putting us out of business, and mobs are ready to riot in the streets. We demand that the Jews be expelled from Rome. The Pope feels trapped between his Christian constituency and his conscience. He says, very well, I'll put the Jews to a test. If they answer three theological questions correctly, they may stay. But unless all three answers are right, they must leave. So, the whole Jewish ghetto of Rome assembles in the social hall of the synagogue. And the order is read that they must pick one representative who must answer the Pope's three theological questions correctly, or they will all be expelled from the city. Who will go for us? asks the president of the council. The hush in the hall is overwhelming, until finally in the back of the hall, little Moishe, the tailor, booms out, I answer foolish questions all day long, every day. What difference will a few more make? And that's how it happens that on the appointed day, Moishe 
is ushered into the Pope's presence in St. Peter's Basilica. The Pope dismisses his advisors with a wave, and the two men are left by themselves. Pope Urban, who does not speak a word of Yiddish, and Moishe, who doesn't know a word of Latin. The Pope begins. In a fanfare of Latin, he points one finger. And Moishe, in a torrent of Yiddish, points back with two fingers. The Pope looks startled. And then the Pope, with more Latin, makes a circle in the air above his head. Moishe replies by jabbing at the ground. A look of respect crosses the Pope's face. Finally, the Pope reaches under his robes and produces an apple. And Moishe digs in his pocket and pulls out a matzah wafer. A look of satisfaction crosses the Pope's face. As soon as Moishe is dismissed, the Pope's advisors rush in, asking, What happened? Do the, did he fail the test? And the Pope replies, The Jews may stay. How can that be? The advisors cry. The Pope replies, We understood each other perfectly. First I said, God is one. And he replied, But revealed in two forms, the Father and the Son. Then I said, God is in heaven above. And he said, but he lived here on earth, too. Finally, I showed him an apple and said, With this apple, sin came into the world. And he answered, But with the breaking of bread, man has been reconciled to God. Meanwhile, back in the ghetto, the social hall is jammed with people shouting, What happened? Can we stay? Moishe says, it's okay, the Pope says we can stay. How did you do it? shouts the crowd. Moishe says, I told you, I answer silly questions every day. First the Pope said, I'm going to poke out your eye. And I said, I'm going to poke out both of yours. Then he said, we're going to throw you guys out of Rome. And I said, we're staying right here. Then he took out his lunch, and I took out mine. Engagement across differences still goes on today, I'm glad to say. We all know how precious water is in Arizona. Up in Phoenix, Arizona State University spearheaded a 30-year effort with the government called the Salt River Project which has assured Phoenix of runoff from the White Mountains for decades to come, even water enough for Arizona's phenomenal new growth. All over the West, water is a fighting issue, and when Western rep state representatives get together, battle lines are drawn and knives are out. Two principal antagonists in the Arizona Water Wars are the Department of Water Resources' Tom Bushatsky and the Central Arizona's project's Ted Cook. Tom and Ted are water professionals who have wildly different visions for how a water project should work. And for years, these powerful voices sat in negotiations as antagonists, fiercely criticizing each other's ideas while promoting their own. But sometime in 2018, Bushatsky and Cook found themselves in a broader conversation with representatives from California, Nevada, and Mexico, trying to share Colorado River water effectively across the Southwest, trying to honor Native American interests fairly and trying to save Lake Mead from extinction. In the face of this challenge, Tom and Ted decided to stop fighting each other. They buried the hatchet, 
and with tentative steps, they took over leadership of these highly charged conversations. Every time talks broke off, they got them started again. Neither one changed his principles, but they each began to work for a greater good, for the ecological survival of the West, of its communities and its industries. Just one year ago this month, lawmakers in three states ratified their agreement for sharing Colorado River water, signing the LBDCP, the Lower Basin Drought Contingency Plan, into law. Bushatsky and Cook were named Arizonans of the Year for 2019 because they continued to communicate, continued beyond ideology, beyond ego, even beyond principle, communicated until respect and fairness became their driving motives. In these next months, water talks will resume. This next round will be even more important because the pumping of groundwater and the future of farmland will be on the table. But we have reason to hope because Tom and Ted will be hosting those conversations. Our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, he who preached love at the royal wedding, says, If we can't reconcile differences in the church, then don't complain about the Congress of the United States. If Ted and Tom can make progress with water, if St. Paul can introduce Athenians to God at the Areopagus, if Moishe and the Pope can sing a song beyond words, then you and I can learn to sit down with our antagonists, we can listen to our adversaries, we can acknowledge their humanity, and we can come to say, surely the Lord is in this place, and we, all of us, are his offspring. Amen.